are not of this world, but are set apart with a higher calling, a bigger purpose, and a greater hope through Jesus. If we are not dead, he is not done. See, we are not ashamed of his gospel, and we will not stop talking about what we have seen and what we have heard. We will not stop sharing what Jesus has done in our lives. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. So may Christ be glorified in his church. May people find freedom, find healing, find hope in his church. May relationships be restored and people feel they belong because Jesus Christ built his church and the gates of hell will not overcome it.
happy Mother's Day. Big shout out to all you moms out there. Thank you so much. You are amazing. We literally would not be here without you. So thank you, moms. We love you. And uh, we're just so happy that you decided to join us today. We're going to be here for about an hour, continuing our series. We have an amazing speaker. You're not going to want to miss it. God's going to speak to you. But let's just continue to worship together. Come on. Days may be darkest, but your light is greater. You light a way, God, you light a way. When evil is rising, you're rising higher with power to save, with power to save. Oh, you keep hope alive. so good to sing those words with you. Why don't you have a seat as we transition into this time of communion. And The communion supply should be in the seat in front of you, and if you're joining us online, now would just be a great time for you to go get those communion supplies so you can participate in this moment with us together. And I love the fact that we get to take communion every single week here at Valley Real Life, that we choose to recognize and remember what our God did on the cross for us every single week every single week and we take the bread which represents his body which was hung on a cross a cross that he did not deserve a cross that he did not sin for and he 
he was hung on a cross. And then we take the juice, which represents the blood of Christ that cleanses all of our sins, all of them. And we remember and we reflect that Jesus is alive, that Jesus said he was gonna rise from the dead and beat death and conquer the grave and rise again. And we remember that sacrifice because it was not free. He purchased our sins. And if you're brand new with us, don't feel any obligation to participate. This is just something that followers of Jesus do. But we're gonna continue to worship together. And and I just want you to take this moment and just remember and reflect the sacrifice of Jesus paid for your sins. So let's pray. God, thank you. God, we, we are so in awe, Lord, of the sacrifice that you paid. God, your goodness is overwhelming. It's incomprehensible. God, we can't understand it. But yet, God, you chose to take a cross in our place. And so we remember that now. In Jesus' name, amen. It was my cross you bore So I could live In the freedom you died for And now my life is yours And I will sing Of your goodness
worship with you guys. Go ahead and have a seat. Last Mother's Day, we launched Pave the Way with an ambitious goal of $500,000 to accomplish a series of projects to improve our community and reach the next generation. While we've made progress towards that goal, we're not quite there yet. But we do wanna stop and take a moment to celebrate what God's done so far with the theming of our kids' ministry hallways, expanding our kids' check-in, and we're just about to break ground on expanding our lobby. We've seen so much growth in our community. In the last year, over 150 new homes have been built and more are under construction every single day. We have a huge opportunity to be a light to the families in our nearby and fast growing neighborhoods. Giving to pave the way today will mean seeing the completion of our next phase, the building of an amazing indoor play area that can be open to our church and our community throughout the year. As an elementary pastor who gets to work with elementary students every single weekend, I am so excited for what this play structure means for our ministry and for those kids. But selfishly, as a parent of a toddler, I cannot wait for what this play structure is gonna bring for us. One of the benefits of this playground is how easy it makes it to invite somebody to come to our church to know that they don't have to sit out in the cold and they come and sit with you and you guys can talk while your kids go and play in a safe space, that's something that our community is seriously lacking. And our friends over at Real Life in Post Falls, they built a very similar play structure and saw some incredible results. Well, several years ago, our team here in Post Falls had this vision, this idea that if we were to truly be a community center like we desired, we would build a space for kids and families to be able to hang out all week long, even when the weather is bad, like it is often here. And the results for us have been even more amazing than we thought. Uh, we have hundreds and hundreds of families here every single week, throughout the week, just hanging out and really being a community center to be able to see moms and kids connecting and doing what we envision as a church is to reach the whole world for Jesus one person at a time. So far, you've generously given over $200,000, which leaves us with $300,000 left to raise of our goal of $500,000. To those of you who have already joined us in this journey, we are so incredibly grateful for your partnership and passion to reach our community. Would you join us as we pray for the kids who will be impacted by Pave the Way, for the families in the surrounding neighborhoods, that they would come to a relationship with Jesus and prayerfully consider who you should invite to celebrate what God is doing. You can learn more and give to Pave the Way today by going to vrl.church slash pave the way. If you've yet to contribute to Pave the Way, we hope that you will prayerfully consider what your gift would mean to the next generation right here in Spokane Valley. This is a house of miracles. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I'm so excited to be able to celebrate this moment, this opportunity with all of you moms. Uh, in addition, we know that this weekend is something that we've been praying for for many, many months, and it's our opportunity to financially give to what we've been calling Pave the Way. As you know, we've already themed out the kids' area because of the gifts and the sacrifices you've given, but now we're going to move forward to an indoor playground, an expanded lobby, and a road that will leave here from Barker instead of just out Barker all the way to Henry as well. And so my prayer is that you, like me and my family, Family, um, are ready to be able to give to him um, either online or uh, through uh, the boxes that are in the auditorium or in the coming weeks to come. Uh, we're going to continue to have this come for the next couple of weeks. But I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being a church that continues to put the mission of reaching people for Jesus one person at a time in the forefront of our hearts. And I know that financially, that's one of the ways that we're able to do this. And so again, we want to praise God and give Glory to him for what he's about to do. Praise God. Hey, everybody. I'm Jolene Fisher. I'm the women's ministry lead here at VRL. And we are so excited about the Pave the Way project because when I was a young mom, I would do anything to get out of the house with my kids. 
You feel me? Any of you ladies out there? Well, we have a VRL moms group that meets here throughout the summers, but in the winters, they really have nowhere to go to play. They do their uh, picnics and lunches out on the playground there. So we're super excited to have them have a space and for all of you in our community to come to a free space. So today and throughout the weekend, we have our Pave the Way offering that can go 100% uh, of your giving goes to the Pave the Way this weekend. So you can do vrl.church slash give or put the money in the drop box on your way out. All right. So prayer requests. You guys have these little cards on your chairs. If you want to grab those, those are a great way for us to be able to pray for you during the week. As a staff, we meet on Mondays and we pray over every prayer request. Those prayer requests also come to us individually as staff, and we like to follow up with you about those and make sure those are being prayed over throughout the week. So we'd love to do that for you. Hey, moms, if you're in the room, hold up that card that you got when you walked in, that little coffee card. That's an important little card there. Don't lose it because that is a free coffee card at the Sold Out Cafe, as well as there's a little QR code on there that we'd like you guys to go ahead and take a picture of. Fill that out, go to the digital connection card in there because we need to enter you into our drawing. We have over 25 different prizes and one of my favorites on there is a house cleaning. So definitely fill that out. <laughs> yes, we'll be doing the drawing on Tuesday so you have up till that time to do it, but don't delay, do it today. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna watch a really cool video here for the moms, you guys are gonna have a, get a kick out of this. Did you know that according to women, childbirth is the worst kind of pain there is? And did you know according to women that us men can't handle any of it? Well, did you know that according to men, women exaggerate everything? Everything. That's why we decided to make an appointment with Dr. Julie Masters. Go ahead and lay back. Okay. What we're doing right now is we're just hooking up the contraction monitor. We're going to be starting to simulate a little bit like early labor. <laughs> Talk to me right now. Now? So you're almost getting to like the active stage of labor where okay. it's really getting good. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Awesome. Awesome, guys. It's starting to come down now. You guys are doing awesome. Focus. Start to be. Are you feeling it? It's going to come down a little bit. It's starting to come down. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Stop smiling. That was not good. It sucked. That sucked. It was horrible. Better than you thought or worse? <laughs> A lot worse. A lot worse. I'm telling you right now, it's, I felt like I was having a baby. Mom, if uh, anything that I just experienced is anywhere close to what I did to you <laughs> all those years ago, I'm sorry, you're like a superhero. You're one tough mama. Mm. Happy Mother's Day. I just want to introduce our speaker today, and that is Sarah Yarborough. Sarah has been on staff with us for a couple of years as one of our counselors, and many of you have been impacted by the ministry that God has given her to help navigate through some difficult times in life. I'm so excited because uh, Sarah is also, you know, a mom. She's also been a pastor, and she has a gift to be able to proclaim God's word to us. So Valley Real Life, can you just join me now in welcoming Sarah as she presents God's words to us? can't believe they gave me the whole sermon. I'm super excited. So buckle up. We're going to talk about some fun things and lesser fun things. That video was really good. That nurse that was holding the barf little can, I was like, she's a great actor. My family and I moved um, from the west side to the inland northwest about eight years ago. And one of the things that I love about living here is the ability to get outside and go do stuff. Whether my kids like it or not, that is part of our spring, summer, fall, winter traditions. And one of the places that I discovered pretty early on was the Hiawatha Trail. 
The Hiawatha Trail is like this 15, 16 mile rail to trail that mostly is ridden by people on their bikes. It's downhill, it's through a bunch of tunnels and you get all the way to the bottom and they have a shuttle bus. You load your bike on the shuttle bus and it takes you back up to the top. The thing that makes this place per perfectly unique is at the beginning there is a long tunnel that goes through the mountain that is about two miles long. The temperature drops like 30 degrees, it is pitch black, and to get into the tunnel at the beginning, they make sure that you have the right headlamp on your bike. You go through the tunnel, and at the beginning of the ride, my kids are like, whoop, 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 echoing in the thing, and by the end, they're like, is this ever gonna end? It is so long and so deep that my Garmin watch doesn't even record where I am. You go through the time zone back and forth because it's right on the edge of Idaho and Montana. Last summer, I got a wild hair when I was marathon training that I would just run the Hiawatha Trail. It seemed like a good idea. It's all downhill. I run long distances all the time. My family was gonna ride it and I thought you guys ride your bikes and I'm gonna run the Hiawatha Trail. So we all got going, I stuck my headlamp on, I took off, I went running, and my family followed on bikes, and they would ride by me, and they would yell at me and do whatever, and, and then they would come back and check on me, and I just ran the trail, and it's beautiful, I love it. About mile eight, though, I started to feel like maybe this wasn't the right choice for me in that day. If any of you guys are runners, you know, there's some runs you just go out and you go, mm, I'm not sure I'm feeling it. There's no way out. By mile 11, I'm thinking this was the worst choice that I possibly could have made that weekend. And my family had already finished and they started sending me texts, where are you, where are you, where are you? By mile 13, I am sobbing, like ugly crying and people are writing by like, lady, are you okay? Lady, do you need help? There's no way out, I just have to finish. So I finally get to the finish line and my kids are there like, uh, where have you been, mom? I'm like, I'm just trying to survive. I get all the way to the end. I'm a marathon runner. This isn't new mileage, but for some reason this run I'd hit the wall. I have a little snack. I get on the shuttle bus. We go up to the shuttle and everybody on the shuttle bus is stinky, particularly me. We get all the way up and as we pull, the shuttle bus pulls up, I realize that I had neglected to factor in that the shuttle bus does not go back through the two mile tunnel they unload before the two mile tunnel. I realized I was gonna have to get off that bus, cold, sweaty, and run back through the two mile tunnel. I sat on that bus, paralyzed, sobbing, and my husband's sitting next to me like, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, I have no option. I have no option. I have no option. And he's like, you know, like, I don't know what to do for you, woman. Like, you gotta get up and get off the bus. And the bus driver's like, lady, are you gonna get off my bus or what? And everybody's climbed off. They've all got on their bikes. So I get up, I put my sweatshirt on, I click on my headlamp, and I shuffle the most old lady shuffle through the tunnel, and what should have taken me less than 20 minutes felt like it took a lifetime. The tunnel is dark, so very dark. The tunnel is cold, colder than you can even imagine after you've sweated and cooled down and then sweated again and then cooled down again. I am stinky, I am mad. But here's the part that was the worst. I was alone. I was alone in a dark, dark, tunnel and I could not see the end. I was in pain, I was suffering, and the only thing that I could do was keep shuffling to the end. Well, my family has crewed enough races with me that they understand that you, they don't just say, good job, you're doing awesome. My husband came back through the tunnel and he knew the perfect thing to say to me. He came up alongside of me on his bike and he said, woman, there are donuts in the car when you are done. <laughs> and that is what got me through the Hiawatha Trail. We're gonna talk today about pain, Jesus, and relationships, two of which are my favorite subjects. Last week, Dan talked about how pain is necessary for growth, but none of us really like pain. I'm a big fan of Jesus, bigger fan of relationships in Jesus, pain, not so much of a fan. 
But I do understand as a runner that if I don't run farther or faster, I will never get better. I have to get past the comfort zone into the crying zone to get better. Here's our anchor passage for today. It comes out of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so our comfort abounds through Christ. All of us have experienced pain at some level. Physical, emotional, relational pain. And relational pain is actually what drives more people into my office than any other kind of pain. Disappointment, unmet expectations, intentional betrayal. So my church family tonight, today, what is your pain? What has been your deepest source of pain? I want you to picture the pain in your hands, just like this. Whatever that pain is, maybe it's pain in the past, maybe it's pain in the present, or maybe it's fear of pain in the future. I want you to picture that pain. I'm gonna pray over that pain with you before we dig in today. God, we invite you to be present here in the now. We invite you to speak into the pain. Lord, there's a lot that goes into all of this, and we ask your voice to be the loudest voice in the room, and that you would take away the distractions, and we would hear from you and what you purpose for our pain. We love you, Lord. Amen. So the passage that we're looking at today is that God comforts us so that we can comfort others, which is this amazing statement of hope. But how do we get from the pit or the tunnel of pain to being a comfort to others? Here's what I've discovered in working with people that if we haven't really come to terms with the pain that we're actually in or we've experienced, we might actually be tempted to reach for something that is maybe a well-worn cliche or something that seems trite. I was talking with a kid a little while ago who had lost suddenly lost unexpectedly a good friend. They had passed away. And a well-meaning Christian mentor said, God works all things for his good. The kid had just heard about the death of their friend and that was the statement. And you know this kid's response? I don't wanna have anything to do with that God. And I do hear that in my office. These are some other statements that I hear God will never give you more than you can handle. Well, mamas, God gives us kids we can't handle every day. Here's another one I hear. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Truth, but sometimes the task is too hard. That God has a purpose in the pain. I hear that one a lot too. God has something better. I heard that during a really hard transition in my life. God has something better for you. Didn't make me feel better in the moment. Or God must have needed them in heaven when somebody passes away. That just feels like a gut punch. These are things that are true, but they are not relevant. And just because it is true doesn't mean it's relevant in the pit of the pain. And for those of us that have been through real pain, doing real things, really hard things, and we've healed from them, we understand that those statements, although true, are not relevant. True, my number two toe is longer than my number one toe. Relevant, only to the person that's fitting me for running shoes and people who have to look at me wearing sandals. I'm sorry. When we, ex when we experience and are healed from very real pain, we have an understanding of what might be truthful and relevant in that moment. So I wanna go back to the pain that you identified just a little bit ago and ways to work through that pain because if we're trying to get all the way through the pain tunnel to the place where we can be comforting to others, we have to look at how we get through the tunnel. So how do we get through pain? These are some common ways I see people work through pain 
And some of them are more effective than others if you want to get to the other side. One of the ways I see people work through pain is through worry. This is a concern, an overwhelming concern that the pain will never dissipate or it will return. A person who deals with pain through worry will be overly concerned with making sure it doesn't happen again. It can cause us to overcompensate in the decisions we make or disengage from new decisions that we need to make. Worry would say, I worry that next time I go out on my long run, I won't be able to make it. Wrecked. We've all been here. When we have pain and it it rocks our world so hard, it wrecks us. There are plenty of examples in scripture of guys who are wrecked with disappointment and pain. Moses is a guy in scripture, we see him when he's a baby and then we see him show up as an adult and he makes kind of a bad decision as an adult and he has to run away and his career as somebody who God is gonna use to save the Israelite people is sidelined for 40 years. Pain, disappointment. There's Elijah who is a prophet of God and he does something, he's involved in such a huge miracle that the whole land looks and goes, man, God is in control. But then he hears that a woman doesn't like him and we find him suicidal under a tree. Women were pretty powerful. This was me when one of my kids left for boot camp. It wasn't even my first kid to leave for boot camp, but a kid left for boot camp and for three days I laid in bed with a box of Cheez-Its and a bucket of peanut butter and I ate straight out of it until my husband said, woman, pull it together. I think he was tired of sleeping in cracker crumbs. (laughs) Sometimes we go through hard things and our life does feel wrecked, but we can't stay there. We have to move from wrecked to another place if we want to get to the place where our being wrecked can cause comfort for other people. Here's another tool that people use when their life becomes very difficult, and that's work. We just work harder. It's the American ethic, is it not? Pull up your bootstraps, let's go. Work double time, work harder, work harder, work harder for that relationship that's falling apart, work harder. And this is where God really convicts me. Because I pretend the pain doesn't impact me, I just double down, work harder, keep shuffling along. But the fourth way of dealing with pain is really where I want to camp out today, and that, that is through worship. And I'm not talking about singing a song. It's so much bigger than that. Worship is this idea of surrendering to the leadership and the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells his followers that in this world, we will have struggles, and yet, and yet we can trust him to walk with us through the struggle. Worship doesn't mean that everything is okay. It means that we trust that when we walk with him, everything will be okay. Because the character of God can be trusted even when the circumstances do not make sense. We may not understand the why or even the what when we're in the pit of pain. We may be in the tunnel alone wondering if God is there or if he even cares. Our confusion about what is happening does not change the character of God. It gives us the confidence to stand in the both and. This is unbearably difficult and God is in it. Church, this is what worship is. It is not having it all together, but it is trusting the one who has already figured it out for us. Isaiah 43, one through three, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, he who formed you, he says, do not fear, I have redeemed you, which is, I've already fixed it, people. I've summoned you by name, you are mine, and when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you, and when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God. I grew up with a dad that loved Jesus and nature. So it's not a huge surprise that I too love that. My dad somehow got connected with this nonprofit ministry that used rock climbing and whitewater rafting to introduce people to Jesus, which is pretty cool, right? So I spent my spring and my summers learning how to belay climbers as a kid and see God in the churning rivers. 
One day I was a part of a raft team and we were preparing for a really big rapid coming up and somehow in that prep, I popped out of the boat. And in all the trips I'd ever done, I had never popped out of a raft, but I popped out of the boat. And in that moment when I dropped in the icy cold glacier waters, I thought I, my body was going to be churned up in the river and I was going to be beat to a bloody pulp in an eddy. I was terrified. And it is amazing how many thoughts you can have when your brain is panicked. But in a split second, there was a hand that had reached over the edge of the raft and it yanked me out of the water single-handedly and plopped me into the floor of the boat. And I looked up and it was a panicked dad, my dad, who had reached over the edge of the raft, picked me up with one hand, threw me in the boat while calling out commands, forward all, right? That is the image that we have in this passage. That we're gonna get wet, we're gonna go through hard things, but our Father is right there, ready to reach out and yank us back and throw us in the boat. I remember sitting at my own Father's feet, looking up and being embarrassed that I had fallen over and amazed that he could one-arm me over the edge of the raft. And that is what it's like to be saved by our Savior, both embarrassed that we needed to be saved, but in awe that he could do it so easily, so simply. In our human life, we will go through trials. We will experience the heat. It's a throwback to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they were in the fiery furnace and yet they didn't get burned up. We can trust in the Lord our God. So my question for you, church, is where in your life have you been thrown overboard and yet saved? There's a story in the Old Testament, a woman named Esther. She is a displaced Jewish refugee. She's an orphan, and she's cared for by an uncle. So her parents have died. She's living not with her Jewish people. She's got some Jewish people around her, but she's living in Persia. And this uncle, instead of helping her to become a strong, independent woman, woo, uh, he manipulates her into joining the Persian version of The Bachelor. And The Bachelor is the Persian king, who, by the way, had gotten rid of his last wife because she didn't obey him. So here's the spoiler alert. She wins and she becomes the queen of Persia. Now, Esther had experienced some pain in her life. Anybody who's lost a parent knows that. She had experienced rejection. Anybody who's lived with people that don't agree with them understands that. She'd been manipulated by the person that was supposed to take care of her. But here's some more background. The Israelite people had been enslaved by the Persian Empire. Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the stories of that. But then God had opened the doors to let the Israelite people go back to their land. They were free to leave, but Esther not only stayed behind with her uncle, but she married the king who was a part of enslaving her people. And here's the really important part. I don't want you to miss this. It's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention the name of God. So why this story, Sarah? Why do I bring this up? Because just because we don't see God doesn't mean he isn't there. It doesn't mean that he's not working in the pain. God is in the story of Esther. Even if Esther can't see it, even if Esther is not surrendered to the will of God, God is still in charge because we see God all over the story of Esther. There's this genocidal plot that unfolds. A government official sets in motion a day to slaughter all the Jewish people that are living in the area. And Esther is married to the king. She pleads to the king on behalf of the Jewish people. She wins the case. The verse that many remember from this entire book is Esther 4.14, which is, for such a time as this, perhaps this, this is the moment for which you have been created. And Esther has this moment of realization, all of the hard, 
all of the pain, all of the lonely, all of the unsure has come to this moment. I was made for this. Comfort others with the comfort we receive from God. When we go through the heart and we lean into the character of God, even when we don't understand, by the time we exit the long dark tunnel, we may just see that God's plan has always been at work in you and through you. You may say, Sarah, I don't have influence over a high powered official. Maybe not. Some of you do, but probably not. But we all have pain points that move us toward positive action. Action that not only comforts, but actually supports others as they heal from their own pain. Look, as we walk alongside people who are in pain, here's the real deal. We can't heal anybody. A doctor cannot heal a broken bone. A doctor just puts support systems in place while the body heals itself. Some years ago when I was raising babies and I was going through a really hard time, like hot mess hard time, like if you saw me in the grocery store, you'd be like, that mom, she's a disaster. I was working full time, I was going to school full time, my life was falling apart and I was desperately seeking to serve Jesus with everything I had and people who knew me, who saw me were like, she's in trouble. This is where the comfort of God shows up. There was a woman who said, she's got babies, I can help. She dropped off a bag of kid snacks on my porch every single week after she went to the grocery store. It had juice boxes and fruit snacks and, and it had granola bars, all the things that kids eat. She couldn't solve my problem, but she could solve one problem and that is that toddlers eat nonstop. They never stop eating and they never stop making messes. She also put in good chocolate in the bag for me. Amen. <laughs> there was a team of high school students who gathered and put together a sign up list and every Tuesday for a year, a babysitter showed up at my house, kicked me out of the house, took care of my kids, bathed my kids, and made me either go finish stuff at work, go finish stuff at school, or just go have a night off, and I never had to pay for a year, and I never had to call anybody to find a babysitter for Tuesday nights. For a year, high school kids did that for me. There was a mom, I'm not advocating this, but I kind of am. There was a mom who figured out how to break into my house and she came in and she would clean my bathrooms and my kitchen floor. Nothing else, but my bathrooms and my kitchen floor. And then she would lock the door and she would leave. I don't know how she broke in, but I know that she did and she never confessed that that's what she was doing, but I could always tell when she was there because I don't know if you've ever had a passel of preschoolers, but your kitchen floor is disgusting. <laughs> There was a dad who just showed up randomly to mow my lawn. He never came inside, he never said hi, but I would come home from work and my lawn would be mowed. There was a mechanic who said, I adopt you and your broken minivan. And he kept that minivan running for five years. I'm a crier, sorry. But here's what was funny about that minivan is I could not keep the door handles from falling off. I don't know if any of you had a minivan like that, but when you have kids that hang on your door handles, and I had a lot of kids who hung on a lot of door handles, every single door handle on that minivan he replaced over the five years that he kept that van running. And he would go, I got it. He would run to the junkyard, he'd come back, he'd put in a new door handle. He got really, really good at putting on door handles and minivans. This, this is comfort from the Lord. These are tangible ways that we can comfort others when they're experiencing pain. This is the body of Christ at work. Because church, we can't fix pain. We can't say something magical or give the perfectly timed hug. We can't even rescue people out of the pain. My husband could not put me on the back of his bike and take me through the tunnel. I had to get through the tunnel on my own. But comfort in that moment was sister. There are donuts in the car. He knew what to say to keep me moving forward. We can show up and we can love others in tangible ways that holds out hope when others feel hopeless. So what do you do with that, church? 
one, I would say church, get into real relationships with real people that you can look other people in and say, I see that you are suffering and I wanna come alongside of you. Real people that you can say, I am suffering, I am in real pain. And those people will come alongside of you. One of the biggest heartbreaks are when people come into my office and they tell me, no one knows this about me. Or when they say, I am really struggling and I am too ashamed to tell my group of people. Church, be real. Get real relationships. If you are struggling to see the character of God and you need to talk with someone or you need prayer, after the service tonight, I encourage you to head to the cross because there's a team of people that wanna pray with you and help you. If you have not been baptized, if you are not at the point, if you've not been to the point where you say, I surrender, I surrender my pain, I surrender my past, I surrender my present, I surrender my future to the creator of the universe because his character can be trusted no matter what I experience and you've not made that public declaration, I encourage you to step up and get baptized. We have everything that you would need to be baptized. If you've not joined a life group yet, I want you to talk to the connection booth tonight before you leave. Those are my challenges for you. I hope that you focus on the character of God, the one who sacrificed his one and only son to have a relationship with you. I'm gonna pray for you and then we are gonna end in worship tonight. God, when, when we are in pain, show up. When we see others in pain, show up. Help us to trust your character, who you are, what you have done in you, what you will do. Jesus, even if everything I know is taken away, I want to cling to you because I know you can be trusted. We love you, Lord. Amen. We're gonna have a moment of response of worship. If you guys wanna stand with us, if you don't know the words, that's okay. This is just your moment to connect with God. And even if you just need to speak these words over your life, that's okay. I just want you to join us. Even if you're watching online, go ahead and sing this out with us. I've tasted and seen, yet questioned it all. Still you remain. Chased empty dreams, ran from your call, and turned back again. And there's no other treasure on earth that amounts to your love. And I know, even if everything I know is taken. Give me
Jesus, and that, I don't know about you, but that's the hope that I need every single moment of every single day. Go ahead and have a seat. Child dedication is your chance as parents to raise your kids to know God, to be who he wants them to be, and to do what he wants them to do, and to make that commitment in front of the whole church. Now, personally, I loved doing child dedication with my three-year-old son, Crosby, because I was a brand new parent. And I, I work with kids all the time, but I had not had a child of my own. And I got to meet all these families who also had new babies. They had new kids. Some of them were first time parents and some of them, it was their third time around. But for me, it was great to get to know and meet other people who were going through this same stage of life going, we have these new kids, we wanna raise them to know God, and now we know other people who are here doing the same thing. If you wanna join us for our next child dedication on May 19th and 22nd, you can register online at vrl.church events.